Amen. Welcome to all those who are tuning in tonight to our Wednesday night service. So glad that you could join us tonight and be here with us. I've been uh, given the privilege to bring the word tonight. As always, I'm excited to do so, to bring God's word. But before we get into that, before we begin, let me just say how good it was to see a lot of you this past Sunday, to be able to worship with a lot of you this past Sunday. I know that we all couldn't be together uh, just yet with all the precautions that we're taking, uh, but it was also good to have some bodies in the pews and to hear laughter in the halls and to see people uh, worshiping and so on and so forth. So, so excited that, uh, that at least that's taken place. Also, I have a couple of, a few announcements actually to make. Want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to go and check out our Facebook page at Calvary Temple page and uh, check out the graduates video that's been posted on there. If you haven't done so already, it's all of our graduates that are graduating. They have a quick uh, a video in there where they're talking about uh, maybe their plans and different things. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to go and take a look at that. It's on our Facebook page. Also, if you would like to give an offering to any of our seniors, uh, the annual offering that we take for the baccalaureate service, you can do so online. There is a tab set up. Uh, for, it's called Graduate Offering. You can do that. If you would like to mail a check, uh, once again, want to remind you that it's P.O. Box 205 here in Saraland if you would like to do so. Regarding our Sunday morning services, again, it was good to see those that were able to come, that were able to make it. We're going to keep the same format as we did last Sunday. We want to encourage uh, those that come on Sunday morning to be of the age of 55 and over. So if you're 55 and over, we want to encourage you to come to Sunday morning service. And for the Sunday p.m. service, uh, we're going to do the ages 54 and under. Now, if your spouse is, uh, you know, somewhere along those lines, either 54 or not quite 55 or whatever the case may be, you guys can pick either or whichever service you guys would like to come, whether Sunday morning or Sunday night. But again, we're going to keep the same format this Sunday as we did last Sunday. Um, 55 and over, we'll be meeting here Sunday morning. 54 and under, we'll be meeting here Sunday night. We'll have worship. We'll, we'll just do it just like last Sunday. Our, our cleaning team did such a great job at keeping everything sanitized. And, uh, you know, just we'll see how long we'll go with this, but we're going to just continue to do the guidelines and what the uh, CDC suggests and everything. But everybody has done a great job uh, so far at keeping these facilities cleaner than they've ever been. So I want to encourage you to come out and join us for worship. We had a great time on Sunday morning, Sunday night, as we met with the Lord, and it was so exciting. Amen. Now, after saying all that, um, I want to get onto the message and talk about this thought that I want to bring tonight for us tonight. And I want to talk about the peace of God. And I know that this subject is vast and that we can go in many different directions when we're talking about the peace of God and different things, what it means. But in today's day and hour that we're living in, if we ever needed the peace of God, it's now. We need it now, today, more than ever. And I know that in the coming days, we're going to need it more than we did even today. Next week, we'll need it more than we did today. Next month, we'll, we'll need it more than we did last week, and so on and so forth. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see and to realize the day and hour that we are living in today. The hidden agenda that's not so hidden anymore, that's making itself blatant, that you can see now today. Again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the climate, the day, and the hour that we are living in. So if we need the peace of God, it's definitely that we need it now, today. I know that in these coming days, things may get harder than they've ever been. Things, the devil's going to turn up the heat. He's going to cramp up, crank up the heat. He's going to do what he's going to do to try and stop the work of God, the children of God from doing what they're called to do. But again, God offers us his peace, and we'll get into that here in a minute. Along with those things, talking about the peace of God, I know that we see and we ponder on everything that's going on on a world scale. But even though all those things are happening in the world scale, in the world scale, we still have our own battles that we face, whether at home, whether at the job, whether it's with the loved ones, just because there's a crisis or just because there's a pandemic or just because something's going on on a world scale doesn't mean that our personal problems or things may not come and attack us or vice versa. Just because something's going on in our life doesn't mean that the world stops. And so I know that things begin to happen that try and come battles and things to try and, and stop us and to try and discourage and all that. 
But I want to direct our attention today, if you have your Bibles, to the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians. In particular, we're going to look at chapter 4, verse 4 through 9. And this is going to be to encourage us. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Philippians in an effort to encourage them, in an effort to exhort, in an effort to challenge them to pray. So this is what the letter, the intention of these verses in the letter was for. And my prayer, my desire, since, since I was getting ready to preach, has been that. For us to be encouraged, for us to be exhorted, and for us to be challenged to go to the throne room of grace, to touch the hem of his garment, to touch God concerning these situations or these matters in light of what, we may, what you may be facing today whether it's anxiousness, whether the world's trying to produce fear in your life, whatever it may be, my prayer, desire is that you would be challenged today to know that God is still in control. Amen. We're going to read that real quick. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things." Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Again, directing our attention to verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Then we go over to verse 9. Rereading verse 9 again. It says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace shall be with you with you. I don't know about you, but that is some encouraging words to know that the God of peace shall be with me if I do these things. Not maybe so, not a hope so, but it's a guarantee that he will be with me if we do these things, the things that we've learned, received, heard, and seen from the word of God. He will be with us to give us this peace that we're looking for, that this world is looking for, especially in this day and hour. Some of the keynotes of a Christian life that we can take notice, that the people can take notice, the world can take notice, is cheerfulness, joy, hope, excitement. From the moment that they get to church, if it's a church that serves the Lord, from the moment a sinner sits in the pew, from the moment those first music notes are played, they can tell and sense some excitement. To the moment that the preacher begins to preach, it can be felt. It's something real. It's not something that's just manufactured, but but it's something that they know is real, a true joy, something that goes out with you even after you walk out of those doors, even after you get in your vehicle, even after you go home. Not something that stays within these walls, not something that stays in the hall outside of the church, but something real that goes with you wherever you go. I know that those are some of the things that this world takes notice. It's supposed to take notice, the joy and the singing, the joy and the praising, how we praise the Lord, how we have that blessed hope, that blessed peace when they walk in, the conviction, the preacher, how he preaches with authority, how the preacher knows and the people know that the man of God has been with God. That's why he's called a man of God. I know that they can see that. Those are the keynotes of true Christianity, what the church is supposed to be and Christians are supposed to be as they're a light to this world. Back in Louisiana, I know a guy, he's a friend of mine, we're good friends, he's a minister now. But now, before we met, I knew him before he became a Christian. But I remember the day God made a change in his life. I remember the day I could see a skip in his step. I remember the day I could see him worshiping just a little bit different. I remember the day I could see him coming to the house of God with excitement and anticipation. Why? Because it was real, true peace, true joy that only God 
God can give. Something like that song says that the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Now we know that there's other keynotes in the Christian life. We cry. We battle together. We hurt sometimes, etc. We could go on and forth. But through all of it, it's a refreshing thing and a challenging thing to see somebody that has pure peace of God through their circumstance. Amen. It's a, it's a refreshing thing to see somebody that knows God in such a way that no matter hell or high water, what's coming their way, they have the true peace, the true joy of God. And with that being said, there's thousands upon millions of people all over this world, all over this country, all over this world, again, I say it, searching for peace. Humanity itself tries to embrace all kind of different beliefs, all kind of different ideas to try and find that which God already has provided. God already has made a way for us to have peace. God already has made a way. He says in order he would give that to those who have learned and received and heard and seen. That's what God says. The peace that this world is looking for in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of gas prices going down, in the midst of chips being implanted, in the midst of all these conspiracy theories, the peace that they're looking for, God has already offered, and he's made a way for us to have it and attain it. Some may believe that peace is simply the absence of conflict or the absence of opposition where I never have to fight again, never have to fight another battle, never have to deal with anything else. But true peace is the presence of someone, and that someone is Jesus. True peace is being in right relationship with God. True peace is knowing that everything is good with me and my Savior. True peace is knowing that I'm not alone tonight, no matter what's going on, no matter if we go to war tomorrow or tonight it doesn't matter true peace is knowing that I'm a child of God hallelujah praise God that is true peace the scripture that we just read the apostle Paul is not just suggesting for us to just drift away and think about who cares it doesn't matter um you know, just whatever, who cares what's going on, who cares about your situation, just don't worry about it, just be careless. No, he's not asking us to do that, but he's asking us and he's encouraging us to look and to seek. I know fear is real. I know anxiety is real. I know that the mind can race and play tricks and do different things. I'm not discounting that. And he's not saying that those things won't attack, but he is encouraging us to look and to seek for peace, the peace and the presence of God, not just to throw it off and to the wind nonchalantly, but to seek diligently for the peace of God and what God can offer and what God wants to do in and through the situation that we may, we may be facing even today. When worry comes, when anxiousness comes, it's like poison to our faith. You hear that? You can have faith, you can be full of faith today, and all of a sudden tomorrow you get a bad report, all of a sudden tomorrow something tragic happens, something to rock the boat, and here comes these things, worry and anxiousness, and it begins to poison our faith, it begins to die, it begins to do something. Here's the definition of poison. It's a substance that is capable of causing the illness or death of a living organism. And so faith, if faith is a living organism, if faith is the substance of things hoped for, the, ed the evidence of things not seen, then when all these things come like poison, it begins to cause illness or death when it's introduced or absorbed. Talking about poison. Talking about what worry and anxiousness and fear does to our lives. Now I like this next part right here. This next definition is the antidote. The definition for antidote is this. Antidote is a medicine that's taken or given to counteract a particular poison. So we're talking about poison. We're talking about anxiousness and fear and worry and all these things that are coming. The world, what it's trying to do to try and poison and take away our faith, to, to make us ill and take that away. And now we're talking about an antidote, which the definition is something, again, a medicine that's taken or given to counteract a particular poison. Why not allow the antidote of prayer to counteract worry, fear, and anxiety? You want to know what the antidote to anxiety is? Prayer. What's the antidote to worry? Prayer. What's the antidote to fear? Prayer. That is the antidote that has been provided by Christ. For any of those things, when prayer is successful, 
when we find that we've made us, when we, when we press into the throne of grace, I'm not talking about a little five, ten minute prayer. I'm talking about grabbing the horns of the altar. I'm talking about going up that hill and not coming back down till you've heard from God. When it's been successful, when we find out that, that it's been successful, we turn from worry or fear, we turn over from all those things to gratitude, thankfulness, and even praise. You realize that. Whenever you finally press through, whenever you finally see see God in your situation, you begin to have an attitude of gratitude. You begin to have an attitude of thankfulness. And then you even begin to praise God for the storm. You even begin to praise God for the clouds. You even begin to praise God that he didn't take you out immediately when, when you thought he, he should have. Excuse me. When you thought he should have. Amen. It becomes from that gratitude, thankfulness, and praise when we finally press through through the throne of grace. If we can just remember this fact. See, the Apostle Paul here, let me see if I could find it. It says, uh, be careful for nothing. It says, the peace of God, pass on and stand and keep your hearts. But in, in here, he also talks about that the Lord is at hand. He's talking about the Lord being at hand. If we can just remember that fact, that the Lord is at hand. Whatever you're going through, again, I said the antidote to these things is prayer, but we have to remember that the Lord is at hand. All that means is that the Lord is near. The Lord is close. The Lord is right here. We make the mistake sometimes that we think that the Lord is up there high above the clouds, past the sun, past the stars. We think that he's way up there and it's going to take a long time before he's going to come from way up there down to where we're at. No, he's saying no, that the Lord is near. You've heard that phrase. You've heard that saying he's as close as the mention of his name. We have to know that the Lord is at hand. The Bible, the word of God says the Lord is at hand. That means he's in there right now. Whether you're in your vehicle, whether you're in your room, in your living room, wherever you may find yourself today, in the prison cell, be in prison, in pr whatever it is, God is there. God is nigh. God is close. The Lord is at hand. We don't have to wait till he comes down from heaven. He's already here. He's everywhere. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody praise the Lord wherever you are and know that he's there. Know that he's watching. Know that you're not by yourself. Hallelujah. When we see him talking about Christ, talking about Jesus, everything else becomes second place. Everything else just kind of fades away. Most of us have heard that old chorus that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. A lot of us have sang that chorus. A lot of us know that chorus, but it's more than just a chorus. It's a reality. When you turn your eyes upon him, you forget about everything else. You forget about the situation. You forget a pro about the problem. Not necessarily that you forget, but you begin to see how big God is and how he'll take care of it and how we don't have to fret and just trust him in peace and grace and mercy and everything. When we discover the excellency of Christ, we should be ready to renounce the old, do away with the old habits, as all they do is hinder us. Lay aside all those weights that the Bible talks about, as all that does is hinder. I got a mountain to climb. I'm getting out this valley. I got a mountain I got to climb, and I got to lay aside all this weight, all this stuff holding me down. I don't have time for this. I'm trying to get up there. We've heard Brother Darrell preach that message, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Well, let me tell you something. It won't be easy but we can do it because God will be with us the Bible says that Moses gave up everything Egypt had to offer which Egypt is a type of the world we know that Egypt represents the world as a type of the world choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God. Why? Because he saw something better than what Egypt had to offer. He saw something way better. I know that the word of God also says that eyes have not seen, ear has not heard, but every now and then, every now and then, brother, every now and then, sister, we catch a glimpse, just a small taste of what it's like. Every now and then, we can catch a small glimpse of what's in store. Every now and then, we catch a small glimpse of who's fighting for us and whose side we're on. And that's on God's side every now and then as you're praying 
Every now and then you can see a little bit, a little bit of ray, a ray of his glory, whatever it may be. And just with that little bit, just with that little bit revealed gives us enough to fight another day, to fight another battle, to win the battle that we're in. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It reminds me of that old story that you read about that old prophet who was just minding his own business. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, Paul Perez version. I'm paraphrasing as he's just sitting there, the old man of God, and and the young man comes in there scared and afraid, saying that they're surrounded. Oh, we're surrounded. There's an army all around us. I believe that man of God didn't bat an eye, didn't flinch. He just got up slowly in the peace of God, in the peace of the Lord. And he told that young man, what are you worried about? And that young man's wondering, don't you see all this stuff? Don't you see the mountains? They're surrounded. And all he tells that young man, that old man of God says, just look up a little higher. Just look up a little higher. Those that before us are more than those that are against us. God is for us today and he's doing more than you can think or imagine. Praise the Lord. That is peace. That is the peace of God that this man had. And see, in having to say that, it's not only meant for us. I'm talking about the peace of God. It's not only meant for us to keep it to ourselves, but it's meant for us to share with others. You see, that man was in turmoil. That young man didn't know what was going on. That young man was ready to run for the hills. Let's dig a hole. Let's go hide. Let's do something. Hurry up. Maybe we can still get away. That old man of God had a peace that he didn't have, but it wasn't just for him to keep to himself. It was for him to encourage somebody else with it. That's what we've been commanded and instructed to do. We'll get into that here in a minute as we go on. In the book of Matthew, there are two parables that are back-to-back -back that are dealing with treasure. In the book of Matthew, we, you may remember these from Sunday school. Again, one, one, man, one of the parables is that one man uh, is in a field and unexpectedly finds some treasure, so he buys a field in order to possess it. I guess I'm not, it doesn't really go into detail on how he got into this field, whose field it was, but the Bible says, the parable says that he was in the field and he stumbled upon the treasure and, and to get that treasure, he ended up buying the whole field itself in order to possess that treasure. That was Jewish custom, that was Jewish law. If you found something and it was your land, if you possessed it, then you can keep it, it's yours. It didn't matter what it was. And so that's the first one. And then we read about the man, when you keep reading, there's another parable in there that talks about a man that's seeking a treasure. But he's not just seeking any treasure. He's seeking a certain treasure in particular. The Bible says that he was seeking goodly pearls. He was seeking goodly pearls, and he must have had his own treasure, his own valuables. But when he found these goodly pearls that he's been seeking, it doesn't say how long, a lifetime, it doesn't say. But it says that he was seeking these. After he found these, he traded everything. He sold everything he had to get this possession. Now, these two parables there talk about treasure, talk about seeking, talk about finding. Real quick, there's a lot of things that this can mean. Real quick in regard to peace. Real quick in regard to our topic. I want to say that there's some situations in our life that come unexpected. Some situations that come out of nowhere. Whether it's a, whether it's a bad report. Whether it's a, a, something that, uh, from the doctor. Whatever it may be. Whether we get sick. There's situations in our lives that just all of a sudden come unexpected. But in our great trial and our tribulation, we unexpectedly find that treasure that is Christ. In the midst of all that turmoil, we find peace and we find comfort that we did not know that it could be attained. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes these unexpected things come. And it's like we're walking in this field and unexpectedly we run into this treasure which is a gem or a jewel or something at God that Christ wanted to show us through this situation that we wouldn't have known otherwise unless we were in this field. Now the other parable is different because this one, this man was seeking. There are other situations where we know something is coming our way. Maybe we have to go to get a doctor's report. Maybe, you know, we know something's coming up, a job situation, a job offer, whatever the case is. Maybe Maybe somebody got a bad report and now we got to go meet with the doctor in six months. And let's see, whatever the case may be, there are situations where we know what's coming our way. But then since we know what's coming our way, we begin to seek. 
We seek diligently for the peace and the direction and the grace and the mercy of God. God, whatever I'm about to walk through, I'm asking you, Lord, to give me the peace, to give me the grace, to give me the comfort, to give me what I need to walk through this valley, to walk through this shadow. So there's a situation again where we just stumble upon it, where, where we unexpectedly, we just see something of God that we've never seen before. And there's another situation where we seek something of God that we've never seen before because we know we need it and we know that that's the only way to make it through this. Amen. I hope I'm making sense tonight. I'm hoping that we, we're getting this. What, what I'm trying to share, what I believe the Lord has given me to share for us tonight. Let this world know. Let this world know. Let this world know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have found a better portion, that you have found your treasure, that you have found Christ, that you have found the thing that you've been looking for, searching for your whole life now that you have Jesus. Let this world know that. Let this world know, let it see, let it see that Christ is your all, that Christ is your everything, not just this world. Let your children see, let your family see, all those around you. Let them see that God, Christ, that Jesus is my all. Amen. Now, we know that there's no price that we can put on the gospel. There's no price that we can put on the word of God. It's value, the value of this. The value of salvation, the blood, and everything else, it's immeasurable. We can't ever put a price. But even though it's, it's immeasurable, even though we can't put a price, it's still available to whosoever will. Salvation is still available to whosoever will. The peace of God is still available to whosoever will. You understand? The Holy Ghost, those that want to be filled, is still available to whosoever will. Am I making sense? It's not exclusive to just a particular person or race. It's to whosoever will, even though it's invaluable. Still, anybody can come from the youngest to the oldest and have this. The peace of God and the grace of God. Salvation. Let's do the value test on the word and the promises of God. Just real quick, just a value test. I don't plan on keeping you too much longer tonight. But what gives something value? When you think about it, there's a lot of things that give something value. But one of the things that gives something value is the rarity of the object. You can apply this to really anything. You can apply this to a vase. You can apply this to a car. You can apply this to guns. You can apply this to a painting. The less of a, of a gun there is, the rarer it is, the more value it has. The same thing for the painting. You know, if it's uh, some famous painter, if he only painted five paintings, you know, versus 100, because he only has five and they're rare, they're more valuable. Certain cars, you know, if they only make 20 cars and everybody else makes thousands of cars, these 20 cars are very rare and very valuable. So now we know that. We know that this peace, we know that this joy, we know that what we have, the world didn't give it. And so because the world didn't give it, it's a rare thing. You can't just go out to the world and find it in booze and drugs. You can't just go out there and find it in alcohol and women and, and it's riotous living. You can't just go out there and find what this book offers just by gambling or doing whatever you think you're going to do by living a good life. It's a rare thing to find. You can't find this in the world. Think about it. It's rare because there's no peace like it. There's no joy like it. There's no love like it. There's substitutes for it, but it's not the same thing. Just like Christ, he told that woman, he told that Samaritan woman that he is the water. He has the water of life, eternal life. He that drinks of this water shall never thirst again. You drink of that well, it's a substitute. You'll be thirsty again in five minutes, but you drink of this water, talking about Jesus, you'll never thirst again. The substitute was not there. You'll not find it. It's rare. But again, it's still available to whosoever will. Does that make sense? I hope it's making sense. It's rare, but at the same time, there's plenty. Amen. It's rare, but at the same time, it's available to those that seek. It's available to those that want it. You can't find anything, anything anywhere else that produces the fruit of the Spirit. Nothing else can produce the fruit of the Spirit. 
The natural world can give a lot of substitutes of joy and happiness and all kind of things, but it's not the real deal. There's a joy in being young. There's a joy in being young. You're carefree. If you're a young man, you're strong as an ox. You can take the world. You can take a thousand men. You feel like why? Because you're young. You may have your beauty as a young woman. You don't. You don't really know the true lives of uh, the true pressures of life yet. You've not faced enough life to know the true pressures of things that come. Yet everything is before your eyes and you have the whole world in front of you. You have endless possibilities of what you can be, where you can go, where you're going to end up and so there's a joy there. There's a joy in being young, a joy in being youthful, a joy in living those, those young years when you're young. There's also a happiness and a joy in being healthy. Everything is working just fine. I don't have no high blood pressure. I don't have anything wrong with my blood circulation. My brain's fine. I don't have any tumors. My lungs are fine. Everything's good. I can jog two, three miles. I can jog five miles. I'm not getting tired. I don't have high cholesterol. Everything is good. Nothing's wrong. No surgeries coming up. No surgeries in the near future. Why? My body is healthy. I'm getting good sleep at night. No joints hurt. I can go sound asleep. I can wake up in just a few hours of sleep. I don't need a lot of sleep. I'm not tired there's a happiness and a joy there when you feel that way again this is just things that you can find in the world there's how about the happiness of success the joy of success the job's going right you got the promotion that that you've been looking for you've you haven't lost a battle everything that you've been trying to do has, has worked out just right if you propose to the to the woman that you love she said yes she didn't say no she didn't reject you just the happiness of everything going right everything everything pray everything is going good again all these things are not bad things and I'm not saying that they're bad things I'm not saying that you, you know, you, you're not a Christian if you experience these things or anything else. But I am saying this. They're not the joy in the Lord. These are not joying in the Lord. All these things are here, just like James said, just like a vapor. They're here one minute, and they're gone the next. They're good as long as they last, but we all know that they only last a short time. You're only going to be 15 for a short time. You're only going to be 25 for a short time. You're only going to be 35 for a short time. You're only going to be 70. You understand, it's only going to go so far. I may be healthy today. Next week, next month, tomorrow, whatever the case may be, this body keeps deteriorating. It keeps going downhill. It doesn't matter. It only lasts for a short time. It's not the joy in the Lord. It's not the joy of the Lord. Now, that is a thing. Another thing that we can do in this value test is the authority. When somebody in authority can give value to something, if a person in authority of authority that's recognized with authority goes to your house and says, hey, this vehicle that you own is worth X amount of money. It's this value. If they're in authority, all of a sudden you're going to believe it. It doesn't matter whether it's a watch. It could be a wig. If you wear a wig and somebody says, hey, this wig is made out of special hairs of this whatever. This is worth millions. Then all of a sudden, because they have authority, you believe it. Because they have authority, we place that value on it because of who they are. Well, Christ is the ultimate authority. Christ is the ultimate authority, and so he knows what's of value and what's not of value. The Lord says to seek him, to seek the kingdom of God first, and all these things will be added unto you. The Lord says to seek him, to save up treasure in heaven where moth or robbers can't get in, where it can't be corrupted. So he knows the value, the importance of it. Of what we're doing. He says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So much as you see the days approaching. He knows the value. He's the ultimate authority. And he knows the value that happens when we all gather together. As the body of believers. As the body of Christ. He knows that. Another thing. Is the durability of an object. How, how long can it last? How long does it last? How long is the lifespan of a thing? That gives it a lot of value as well. It gives it value. When something lasts, the test of time. You can buy good brick. You can buy cheap brick. You can buy untreated wood. You can buy treated wood. Obviously, the better things that you buy, the longer life it has, the more value, the more expensive it is. You can use certain types of wood. Certain types of wood are harder. Certain types of wood can go in water. Water resistant, different things. There's the value in the different types of things. Now, again, the word of God says to store up our treasure in heaven. 
The word of God has proven time and time again, test generation through generation. This has proven the test of time of his faithfulness. We can say, great is thy faithfulness. This has proven time and time again, testimony after testimony of what God can do. Where is the value? The value is in everything that we've just described. But this has lasted the test of time. They've tried to burn it. They've tried to stop the printing press. They've tried to get rid of it. They've tried to hide it. They've tried to mock it. They've tried to deny it, but it's still here. The word of God is still here. Anybody that picks it up with an open heart, with an open mind, can still feel and know that God is real. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. That is the living word of God. And finally, finally, we're about to come to a close. The value of something can be measured by how relevant it is how appropriate it is, how up-to-date it is for the times. How up-to-date it is up to the times that they're living in. Let's say that you, this, this is going to be a scary scene for those of you that don't like to fly. If you don't like to fly, this is going to be a very scary scene for you if you try and picture this. But this is for the example that I'm using. Talking about relevancy. Talking about the Word of God. Talking about how it's relevant. Now, Let's say the plane is crashing. The plane is going down. It's going down fast. And all of a sudden, you don't know what to do. The plane is going down quick. And some man comes up to you, and this man has a wad of cash, a briefcase, and it's full of, 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 of hundreds of dollars, of thousands of dollars. And he says, hey, sir, hey, ma'am, in this briefcase, I have $20 million. Here, would you like to have it? The plane is going down. What good is that going to do to you? Or let's say he comes to you with a deed to a mansion, a deed to a nice resort or houses or stuff, and he comes to you with all these things, and he says, hey, I have all these things for you. All you got to do is sign here, and it's all yours. The plane is going down. What good are these things going to do for you? It's not relevant. It's not up to the times. It's not up to your situation. What do you need? What do you desperately need? You need a parachute. If he comes to you with a parachute or something, that's what you need the most. Okay, we talk about a sinking boat. When the boat is sinking, when you don't have a place to, to go with the boat, what do you need the most? You need a life raft. You need another boat. You don't need money and millions of dollars. All that means nothing. Why? It's not relevant. Money doesn't do anything. This word of God is always relevant. It'll always be the parachute. It'll always be the boat. It'll always be what you need it to be when you need it. It was written over 2,000. It was written a long time ago, years and years ago. I believe it was Sister Sue Price I was talking to with today as she taught Sunday school how it's just relevant of today. Doesn't matter what pandemic is going on. Doesn't matter what's going on with the government. Doesn't matter what's going on with this world. The word of God is still relevant for today. It's amazing how it's still relevant. How I can still pick up the book. Why? Because it's alive. Praise the Lord. It's alive today. The word of God is alive. It'll work in the city. It'll work in the jungle. It'll work in the schools. It'll work for the poor. It'll work for the rich. It'll work in the prisons. Hey, man, it'll work anywhere you apply this. That is the living word of God. Praise Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's soul satisfying treasure. The treasures of this world can never, will never satisfy the soul of man. What this world has to offer, the peace and the comfort that it has to offer, will never fully satisfy the soul of man. In the natural, when somebody is rich, when somebody has a lot of earthly treasure, especially in third world countries, especially in countries where there's a lot of poor, oftentimes they're envied, oftentimes they're hated by people, oftentimes they're in danger of their family being kidnapped for ransom, oftentimes they're in danger of being robbed by thieves. Why? Because they're rich and they have a lot of money and just because they're well off. That's in the natural, in the spiritual. When you find a treasure, which is Christ, when you've given your all and you're living for Christ, you become rich spiritually. When you become poor in spirit, it says that the kingdom of heaven is yours. Access to the kingdom of heaven. You get the keys to the vault of heaven to reach out for the grace and the mercy that you need. But just like you have all those haters and just like you have all those things that envy in the spiritual when somebody, a true believer, has Christ, he's hated by the devil, envied by wicked men who will seek to rob them of what Christ has given you. 
People will take notice of your joy. People will take notice of your peace, and they'll try to go out of their way to try and ruin that. It could be your spouse. It could be the very well person that you live with. Conviction might be too strong, hitting them too strong, and you come fired up from service. Well, here comes that person all of a sudden try to get you down, try to get you discouraged, try to rob that joy, try to be a thief, and try to stop you. Why? Because they see that you possess something that they don't have, and they're trying to take it away. But let's listen to Christ and hold on to him. Praise the Lord. Again, in the natural, those who are rich don't worry about a lot of the things. Those that have treasure don't worry about a lot of the things that the poor worry about or those that may not have treasure. In the spiritual, those who are full of Christ, those that know Jesus shouldn't worry about those things that unbelievers are worried about. We shouldn't be worried about these things. What does the Bible say to do? Look up for the redemption draweth nigh. What does the Bible say? You start to look at the signs. You get excited because you know that his return is near. His return is soon. You want to know the people that are most scared when you talk about the end times and the rapture of those people that know that they may not make it. Those are the people that are the most afraid when you're talking about the rapture or the Lord coming back. Again, in the natural, finally, in the natural, a man who has a lot of earthly treasure can help his neighbor more than somebody who doesn't can. Somebody that has a lot of treasure, a lot of wealth, can help more than somebody that doesn't can. Believers who are rich in faith, rich in experience with God, are full of the promises of God. They know that they can give guidance. They can give counsel. They can give comfort. Proverbs 10.21, part of it says, the lips of the righteous feed many. Now, if we have that treasure, if we have that treasure, we are to encourage people. We are to share that which we have. We are even commissioned in Matthew 10, 13 with the authority to leave the peace of God. The Bible says, Jesus said, that when you go to a house, if it's deemed worthy to leave the peace of God in that house, but if it's not worthy, it says to take the peace back and let the peace return back to us. That means that we can leave that peace of God in that situation, in that place. But if we're able, if we want to do this, first, we have to be recipients of this peace. We have to experience this peace in our own lives. God intends for us to be spirit-filled vessels that his peace can flow through and touch the lives of everybody that's around us. Peace has to be apprehended and enjoyed by faith. So once this peace becomes a reality in our lives, we're able to share this peace and encourage other people with this peace that only God gives. It's going to keep us from sinking. It's going to keep us calm in the midst of the storm. The peace of God. Amen. Again, there's so many directions that we can go talking about the peace of God, talking about the treasure in the field, talking about the gospel. But tonight I just simply wanted to encourage you, wherever you may find yourself, whatever your situation you're facing today, to know, first of all, that God is at hand. He's near to you right now in your very situation. He's near to you. The other thing is that he's there to give you whatever you need when you follow his rules, when you love him, when you follow his commandments. He's there to love you. He's there. He's there. My sheep know my voice. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. So know that he's at hand. Know that he's ready. Know that he's there to walk with you and talk with you, whatever you have to face. So I want you to be encouraged in that fact that Jesus knows where you are. We're going to go ahead and we're going to close in prayer. And we're going to pray that the Lord will be with you through whatever you may be facing today. I don't know what your situation may be. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's going on. But I can assure you, God knows what's going on. And he's with you, and he's for you, and he's here. And that peace that you get is not meant for just to keep it to yourself, but what you learn is meant to be shared with this world, for this world to see what you have. Amen. The antidote to worry, the antidote to anxiety, the antidote to fear is what? Prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to come and hear your word. I pray today 
that it may fall on good ground, that you would continue to give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Help us, Lord, to stay focused on you, on your will, and what you want us to do, Lord. Bring us back safely on Sunday, prepared to worship, prepared to hear your word, and to meet with you as we meet back on Sunday. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Just want to remind you about our service. We will be having service as the same format as last Sunday morning. If you're ages 55 and over, want to encourage you to come to the Sunday morning service. And if you're 54 and under, we have the Sunday night service that you could come. Just we're following these guidelines and these rules. But looking forward to worshiping with you. Looking forward to seeing you again. We'll be going live at 1030 here on Sunday morning and then again at 5 o'clock on Sunday night. Amen. I hope you guys have a good night. Praise God. Amen.